Ready for the snap? Let's go. Yes, listeners, on the day of Super Bowl 53, we are back to give you our very own showpiece event. Ours may be significantly cheaper, but there's a few similarities. NFL social media certainly benefited from the pace of Usain Bolt, matching the 40-yard dash time in his trainers. We have pace in the form of a British speed skater. The New England Patriots and Tom Brady are irritatingly frequent regulars in the Super Bowl, a bit like this podcast presenters, who are always here, and we will have just as much explosive material as the NFL season finale, but not quite as much as that demolition team had when they destroyed that Colin Kaepernick mural in Atlanta. Welcome to Sportsville. Hello listeners, welcome to episode 35. As always, brought to you from King's Place here in London, I am here on hosting duty as is my pod partner, Will Moulton. How is life? I'm enjoying the background violin music. I feel it like adds a, a, a nice ambiance to the podcast. Yes, because we don't usually record on a Sunday, but we seem to have stumbled into a little bit of a crowd waiting for a performance. I think it's orchestra. a violin making class, actually. Oh, is it? Because, yeah, there's just a lot of tuning going on downstairs, but it's quite nice. It's nice yeah. atmospheric ambiance. If you so like. if you get bored of our voices, you can just listen to the, the music in the background. Exactly, yes. Um, some of the stories that mainly clarifying from my intro, um, the Colin Kaepernick demolition, which you may or may not have seen on the internet. I don't know if you did. I've read about it, but I haven't actually seen it. Yes, so <laughs> in, in another example of perfect timing, Colin Kaepernick, who of course is the NFL player who kickstarted all these protests, there was a mural curated of him on a wall on a house in Atlanta, which is where the Super Bowl is this year. That house is a mile away from the stadium, and mysteriously, this weekend, it was demolished. Uh, the artist behind the mural said the timing was, quote, mad suspicious. That's take a great of that, quote, that is. Take of that what you will. <laughs> Um, so yeah any other things been happening in your life because I know it was the Jaffa Super 6s last weekend which you kindly got me free tickets for it was and we both bumped into former guest Shona McCallan as well which is nice although I do see her every day Um, anyway uh, it was a good event Um, again indoor hockey at its finest a lot of goals this year unlike last year so you definitely were spoilt with some of the the action on show. Shame the women's final was slightly one-sided, but just a little bit. The, the, the men's final was really, really good. The though. men's final was brilliant. Was uh, the brilliant. whole men's tournament was brilliant. Um, so that was, yeah, a good day out. And then just a busy week this week with certain specials for, for the podcast. And very glad to say we almost have a second rugby special lined up. Just actually need to conduct the interview, but everything else is in order. And hopefully we'll have at least one more after that as well. So thank you for everyone to lis- who listened. And if you haven't checked it out, then make sure you do. Yes, indeed. Anyway, on with the show, and here is a very brief rundown of what's to come on episode 35. In part one, our feature interview guest on this episode is GB short track star Ethan Treacy, who chatted with Yash Madumbai, who's making his podcast debut on Sportspiel. Part two of the podcast is where we chat about the happenings in sport. First, we will have our news roundup, followed by our discussion section, which this time around looks at the strength in depth Uh, Britain are currently enjoying in the female winter sport ranks. That comes off the back of medal winning outings from the likes of Mena Fitzpatrick, Jen Cahoe and also new addition Charlotte Banks. Before we go there will also be time for Ask Alistair, the feature which tests my knowledge with a sports trivia question before throwing a question out to you, the listeners. All of that is to come but first it's time for our feature interview. Ethan Treacy is a name that is frequently mentioned as one of the British short track speed skaters to watch. He made his Olympic debut in Pyeongchang 2018, a dream fulfilled in itself, but there is still plenty more he wants to achieve. In this interview with Yash Madumbai, he takes us through his speed skating journey and his aims for the future as well as his family influences. He is, of course, one of three speed skating brothers, along with elder brother Farrell and younger sibling Niall. Follow Sportspiel Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram, or go to our website, sportspillonline.com. So, welcome to this interview with Sportspiel, and today I have with me Ethan Treacy, who's a, a short track speed skater for Great Britain. And Ethan, how are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh... 
just got back from busy day training. Sure. And um, so we just wanted to speak about your sort of journey into short track speed skating and, and what you're looking to achieve in the next few years. Um, so firstly, what inspired you to take up the sport? Uh, well, how I got into the sport was, it was through uh, my older brother. So he got drawn into it by one of his school friends. Uh, and then like once I saw Farrell, my older brother, on the ice, uh, it was kind of just like... I just wanted to get on there and like race against him, sort of thing. And like, so we've always had a competitive like nature between us, like growing up. So, yeah. Sure. And you speak. You've spoken previously about your competitive battles with Farrell um, in in the early part of your sort of beginning into the sport. How vital is it for sports people? Do you think to have that kind of edge at young age? Uh, yeah, I think it's it is pretty important just to be like naturally competitive and just be like brought up around that so like when I was younger I played like football tennis uh, it was just like always like in a competitive like environment and then like with my brothers like yeah there'd always just be we'd always just like even like the smallest things would be competing over the littlest things so yeah and and with the sport obviously there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of hard work that goes into it and some of I've seen on your twitter account some of the injuries that you've had um Sort of how how have you been able to sort of uh, deal with that, and did that sort of deter you from the sport at, at an earlier age? I guess like at the earlier ages, like the injuries weren't like they're not as major, so like you do fall a lot, but it's just like very minor, just like bumps and bruises. Uh, so from that point, it was just kind of about like just getting back up and then just like keep trying probably like the worst part would be like you're just like your suit's soaking wet from like falling on the ice and I'm to skate the rest of the session in a wet suit but uh the hardest is like as you're going faster and like getting bigger injuries is like when you're off the ice for like potentially like three four months that's when it becomes like mentally really hard to get back on and like carry on training because I found like going through like training, doing a rehab program is like so much harder than like actual normal training because it's just so much different to what you're doing and it's not what you want to be doing. You want to be on the ice, but you have to end up just like slowly just like going through the rehab and I find that so much harder than just like day-to-day training. Sure, and in terms of your dynamic now with your brothers, you obviously have now three brothers in the sport with Niall also having his own success. Is that... Does that help you in terms of getting through those tough moments? And and could you speak a little bit about that dynamic with with all of you sort of competing for Great Britain at the moment? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's like a very positive like dynamic between us. So like we're quite close. So when like one of us are struggling, like probably like the first point of call would be like one of like the others would go up and like would be like their first point of like support and give them just like the support just to like cheer them up and get back on uh, and I think in terms of like pushing us forwards like there's like with the competitive base there's always that drive that like always pushing like chasing each other's heels and you're pushing each other's forward and like with Farrell being like the oldest and like he's already had like quite a lot of success like with going to the games uh, sure. so that's something that's like allowed us like well, giving us like something to aim for and just like all right yeah now we gotta like step up and reach Farrell's level uh and I think like yeah with Niall coming up as well for his successes it's uh it's providing beneficial and it's like helping us like improve more are there any sort of uh down aspects to that is it sometimes get too competitive in this kind of environment or is it has it all been positive so far for you uh, yeah, so far it's been like it's been pretty positive because like a lot we'll do a lot of training together, but when we'll go to competitions, it's very rare that we'll actually like end up being in like the same races. Hmm. Uh, like probably the only downside hmm. is because I live with Nile, I share a house with Nile, uh, and spending sometimes you can spend too much time with your brother, and like <laughs> he just becomes yeah. like the annoying little brother again. So, but yeah. apart from that, it hasn't been too bad. Sure. And um, in terms of looking at the last few years for you, you've obviously had a lot of success yourself. 
um, in terms of competing at European Championships and even the British Championships? What's been like the standout moment for you so far when you look back at your career? Uh, I think like my strongest season was like last season as well. Like made quite a big leap and I started training on the national program. Uh, so I think within that season, I have like a couple of uh, pretty like memorable moments where I won my first. Uh, star class medal which was like the European circuit That's right. so on my first medal there um, that was a pretty that was a pretty like good milestone to hit because it was something like as a junior I was always skating at them competitions and I was like I never made the podium before so to make the podium was a, was a pretty special moment and then even to like then later on in the season I went to the European Championships in the relay and just to skate like my first senior international debut was uh, that was just like a pretty special moment to be on the ice with like some of my idol skaters that I've like looked up to for years. Uh, and yeah, sure. And is is that kind of those kind of moments? Are they almost sort of double in value just because of the experience of sharing sharing the ice with some of your idols? As you said, is, does that make it even more special for you? Uh, I think in the moment, like when you step on the ice, so like going into like these. The more senior competitions with these like the uh, top quality skaters. Once you step on the ice, you kind of like leave it to the side. That like it's not like kind of like leave the respect to the side. Where mm. it's like they're just another competitor now. And then like, I think it's afterwards. Then you kind of once you're reflecting back, and then it's like then it becomes more special. In terms of your own career, when did you sort of realize yourself that yes, I can make it at this level? Has that has that moment arrived for you, or is it? Are you still sort of? Do you still have doubts in your mind? Uh, but I feel like, so like as I was like progressing, like going through junior years, uh, it was always like an aspiration, and like there'd always be milestones that I'd aim for. Like ultimately, the Olympics is like the major one, but I'd always have like little milestones. So at the moment, like I've I've been hitting them. Uh, so, like, there's still more milestones I have to hit before, like, I'm getting to the Olympics, but I seem to be, like, on track and reaching them. So, like, there's always, like, you always have, like, bits of doubt creeping in, but as long as, like, you keep, I keep my head focused and, like, constantly just, like, have the clear goals and just constantly aiming for them, then I feel like it's going to go all right. Oh, and in terms of your aim for these upcoming years, in terms, of, you're always saying your obviously big aim is to like compete at the 2022 Olympics, and also you've spoken about wanting to qualify for World Cups. Is part of that almost trying to just better yourself in terms of just getting more experience at that stage, and maybe down the line you can even win more medals, or is it, or is is your ambition at the moment to really sort of dominate and and really go for a medal, or is it just to get the experience? Yeah, I think uh, at the moment uh, it's getting experience. So the start of the season, I went to my first World Cups, sure. uh, and it was yeah the main aspect of that was just to gain as much experience as possible. Because as it was my first like competition, I was quite I didn't really know what to expect. And then like once I was there, it came like the results and the outcomes came as like a bit of a shock to me. I kind of went in like blindsided. Uh, so then that like I had to come away from them and like reevaluate. So at the moment it's still just like getting the experience at the World Cups and then just like how can I keep moving forward so that eventually I can be in the position to win medals. Sure. And in terms of I think you mentioned previously to someone that in the qualifying period you, you were you were not too worried about what everyone else does so long as you try your best. Have you always had that kind of mindset where you're where you're completely focused on your own efforts, or has it been has it been something you've developed over the years? Um, well, I think for me, like I perform best and like I train best, and like, all my processes work well when I'm fo- focusing on myself. Because I haven't always done that, and like at times when like my focus has like moved away from myself, and it's like onto other people or like results or end outcomes like generally the actual level of performance seems to dip whereas when like, I found like I focus more on myself and like 
put everything more internally and like all my focus internally the like level my level of performance seems to pick up and like improve at a faster rate oh, and is that is that hard for you at this at this stage because there's so much sort of uh a sort of coverage of the sport and there's so much social media going around is that is that becoming harder for you or are you able to sort of still do that and sort of still be able to do that consistently uh, yeah well i think the, the aspect of the social media like i feel it doesn't play like a massive impact like within that uh, i feel like the focus is more like with like the individual athletes like around you and like other athletes from like different countries that's where like a lot of as like an athlete you start comparing yourself to them mm-hmm. as like that's like you just try and like start set, setting benchmarks and like you're seeing what they're doing mm-hmm. whereas it's more like trying to focus what you're doing but i feel like the aspect of like social media because with like the terms of the coverage we get it is still quite like uh, it's very minimal and uh, yeah. Uh, just going on that as well, you, there was obviously UK sports decision to withdraw the funding from short track speed skating. Um, how did that make you feel at that moment when you heard the news? Yeah, when that news came from the day, um, it was pretty devastating. As a team, we all got uh, given the news uh, together and it was kind of a bit of at the time it was a bit of like disbelief everyone just ended up just like sitting there and not knowing what to say uh so that came as a massive shock shock to us all uh as like particularly disappointed as like I've, i literally had only just made it onto the national team so then for the, so that to then be like taken away was just like was just like a big buy there yeah, exactly. And does that add extra motivation for you, like in terms of getting to an Olympics and sort of making your mark when, say, pe- say, sort of organisations have not been behind behind you and your sport? Does that add extra motivation? Yeah, definitely. It gives you like it does give you the giant factor that like you've got something to prove and like prove them wrong that we still had a program that could have been funded and it's got the potential to be like getting results at the games. But yeah, it's definitely something that'll help drive us forward. Sure. And even um, the Nottingham Building Society have helped the cause for athletes like yourself. Um, how important has that been to, been to you and other athletes? And, and sort of how does that help for the next, even the next generation sort of, these kind of organisations helping you out, even when UK sport hasn't hasn't helped you out in in this cycle of the Olympics. Yeah, so the like, the support from like the organisations and like the Nottingham Build site that helps support me, uh, they're like really beneficial. So I think most of them go through a program uh, called Sports Aid, uh, and they like target for like talented young athletes, and they provide. Uh, some financial support and like uh, some like other like lifestyle support uh, and like it's really that is like really beneficial because especially like as you're trying to progress generally like equipment and training costs are starting to increase so that financial support is like as the further you go it becomes a bigger and bigger thing uh, so that's, that's going to be one of the problems that we'll be facing like once all our funding is completely uh, finished, so it's just financing, like running, going into the games for three years. Sure. And in terms of, as I think you mentioned, in terms of the equipment being so expensive and, and stuff like that, did that? How was that experience for you at at your beginnings or, or in short track speed skating? Did sort of how 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 were you able to get involved with that? And is it is it easier these days to for youngsters to get involved in the sport or is it even more difficult yeah no i think at entry level uh, it's really easy for skaters to get involved because most clubs will have like a whole set of like higher boots or like loan boots that skaters can borrow uh which makes it like easy so people can literally just like turn up and just like pick a pair of boots as long as like and bring a helmet uh, so 
like in terms of like the equipment at that level, uh, the clubs are very good at uh, supplying for like beginner skaters, and then like once you become like so like advanced, then you start like buying your own equipment. For yourself, you're also <laughs> while handling your Olympic ambitions, you're also sort of juggling it with the university. How how has that been for you? And in terms of does that does that help you with say you can sort of compartmentalize different aspects of your life or is it uh, how is it how has that experience been for you uh, yeah so uh, i've just started uh, this september so i'm in the first year at the moment okay. uh, and it's been a bit of a shock getting used to it because it's such like the training schedule is like quite busy as it is yeah. and then fitting all of uni around that is it's more of just like a massive juggling act really than anything because it's like the first term of uni is like, isn't like super hard, it's kind of like easing you in. Sure. So the biggest shock I've just found really was just uh, juggling it all in because we'd have ice in the morning, which is like you'd have to go to and then like once I'd finished ice, I'd go straight to uni and then go to my lectures and seminars. And then once that's finished, I then have to go do another session after. So it just becomes a really long and busy day. But as long as like I've organised everything and I've like got food prepared, I'm generally like, finding it okay. Sure. And is that um, you speak? You've spoken about it being very long and busy days. Um, how are you able to sort of motivate yourself for that? Because I mean, I know from my experience going to university, it was really hard to juggle all the different aspects of life that you have there. How, how, how have you, uh, is there anything that you can share that has helped you in that experience? For me, with like the juggling everything, the biggest thing I've learned was just being very selective and mm. like smart with what you're choosing to do and like how you're choosing to do it. So like when, like the first couple of weeks, I was trying to cover everything, like, like do notes for everything, whereas like in reality, I didn't need to do notes for everything, so I was like, I focused my attention into like the hardest areas and the areas that would require like the most effort. Mm. So I feel like that's like made me much more comfortable and like confident with my ability and like managing everything that I've got the hardest parts covered because it's quite easy just to trying to put the harder parts in the corner and like shy away from them, but then. Mm. I feel like you'll just get caught out there. So I feel like going for the harder and doing the more tricky things first and getting that out of the way is much more beneficial. Sure. And has that helped you in your in in your in your sport as well? Has that has that sort of have you seen the benefits of of that kind of mindset yet? Uh, yeah, well, I think in skating, it's quite a easy thing to get drawn into where. You just end up training and doing the things you really like doing and the things you're really good at. Whereas, like in some respects, that is useful to then like just make that even better. But like, especially at like a development phase, uh, it's much much more beneficial to be like to like pinpoint your weaknesses and then find ways that you can make them better because that's where you're going to be able to make like the most improvement in like the long term sure and just and just finally Ethan, in terms of what are your aims going forward for the next for the next year and and couple of years going forward um that that you think are really important for you uh yeah well in like the immediate term we've got um we've got the Euro set of european world cups coming up at the start of february in germany and italy and then i'll be back home for two weeks and then I'm going to the Winter University Games uh, and that'll be like my milestone event for the season. Uh, I'm not really sure what to expect because it all depends on like who enters and I've never been to like a multi-sport event before but then that will be like kind of the end of this season uh, and then I think going forwards would just be after that, it's just like going to the World Cups and just like continually improving. So then, by the time we get to the Olympic year in 2022, uh, 
I'll be ready to uh, perform at them World Cups and qualify a spot for the Olympics. Sure. So, yeah, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Ethan, for your time and I wish you all the best um, in your future endeavours. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to find our episodes and other video content. Thanks again to Ethan for coming onto the show uh, and also to Yash for conducting that interview for us. There will also be a written piece coming up on the website um, once I've uploaded that and Yash has written that article. Coincidentally, the British speed skaters are currently out in Dresden uh, at the ISU World Cup this weekend, so we do hope everything is going well. I'm sure there'll be a, a bunch of results posted on their website once we've done recording. Um, and we're also building up quite, quite a list of speed skaters on this this podcast what with the least christian charlotte gilmartin being former guests but anyway it is time to do some news as it's news roundup time for those who are new uh, myself and will get two minutes to go back and forth to give you some of the most important sports headlines from the last couple of weeks some uh, of you may have seen them some of you may have read the articles but also there may be some stories that have passed you by so timer at the ready Yep. Is it at the ready? At the ready. Okay, so... Three, two, one. Thank you. My first story, then, is an unprecedented case in Argentina where female footballer Macarena Sanchez is taking legal action against her club and the country's football federation for not recognising her as a professional player. The 27-year-old plays for UAI Urquiza, who are based in Buenos Aires, and they are one of the best teams in the country, having won the league last season and also qualifying for the Copa Libertadores. Sanchez has played for the team since 2012, so what has actually triggered her move? She was told last month by the team's head coach that she was no longer required by the club for football reasons. That left her unable to finish the season with the club, and she also can't move to another club for six months. For context, all of the players from all of the teams in the Argentinian Women's League are considered amateur um, by the clubs and the federation, but Sanchez's argument is that they should be give, uh, given or considered professional and that clubs disguise the players' professional status from public authorities by paying them through other jobs outside of football. So since 2014, Sanchez herself has received a monthly salary um, and she was working part-time in an admin role for a company that has links with UAI. Her lawyers say Argentinian clubs use this structure so they and the federation can control the development of the women's game. The clubs on the other hand say that the women's game doesn't generate enough money for them to be professionals. To round off, Sanchez says she won't pocket any money if she wins her case but it's about the principle and that she is fighting for women's rights. 20 seconds left on the clock. Obviously that could be a very pioneering and interesting moment in Argentina for the future of women's football and considering we're now in the country that has a fully professional top tier top league could be a big moment in seeing where the professionalism of the women game goes in that country and also globally speaking of uh, women's football have you seen what Benfica have been up to in the Portuguese second tier this was, season was that that ridiculous scoreline I saw yeah, in the week that's like a 32 nil win they've scored 257 goals in 16 games yes. or something ridiculous It's like a bit that. like Man United where they've been formed and put into the second division where they're clearly... Yeah, but at least Manchester better. United have been given tests in that league. Occasional tests, yeah. Occasional tests by the likes of Charlton, Tottenham, Durham. Mm -hmm. They've had a few sort of tough games, but uh, yeah, Benfica have been doing outrageous things. Did you also, since we're on top of your women's football, see the crowd attendance for an athletic, that athletic Bilbao, I think it was athletic Bilbao game, broke... The record attendance for a women's game. It was a league game. Forty-eight thousand people turned up. Wow! Which forty-eight thousand? Forty-eight thousand turned Insane. up for that game in Spain. Spain so, is definitely leading leading the way in terms of women's club football at the moment. Exactly. We're doing a lot of good work there. Yeah. So tune in, find that video and those pictures because if, if you can get an atmosphere like that, a women's game it just does a world of difference. So yes, on to the next story, which is brought to you by Will Moulton. My title that I've written for this is England being England at cricket. Does that mean being terrible? <laughs> Just being stupidly terrible. So after a pretty good tour of Sri Lanka, it looked like the test team was, was back on track and things were looking good. However, the last two weeks have seen two huge defeats to the West Indies in the West Indies and all of a sudden questions are being asked about 
where this team is at because to be honest no one really knows <laughs> they've been embarrassed by a West Indies team that is on the rise they seem to have sorted their contractual issues between the players and the boards aside to the likes of Darren Bravo have come back the test team looks really strong in captain Jason Holder they've got one of the world's best seamers at the moment I'm not going to say fast bowlers because he's not express pace but he's getting wickets plenty at the moment and not conceding many runs and he's led that team so well and they've got such an aura about them at the moment it's different to what people have experienced for the teams of the 70s and the 80s with the rapid fast bowlers and the, the dominating performances. But this, this team have definitely got a spark about them and they fully deserve their victories. But on the other hand, England have been rubbish. The bowling the bowling's been okay. Um, obviously, there was that 200, excuse me, 200 and something run partnership in the first test that took the game away from England. Um, but the bowling has been okay, but the batting, they've just not been able to cope with the conditions the fast bowling. My voice can't cope with it either at the moment. We should have clarified before starting this, this episode that Will has been suffering from man flu. Drink, drink <laughs> no, water. I've just got a cough. But I will finish by saying a huge hats off to Al Zari Joseph. On this, this is a serious note. On the night of the, the, the night of the third day, of the second test, his mum passed away, and he came out and not only batted but took two really crucial wickets. Such bravery and maturity by a young man. Huge hats off to him and, and to the West Indies for their incredible performance. And now I will take a drink. Would you, would you like me to take over talking duty for a while? Very impressive that you managed to get through that. I've never lost my voice like that before. <laughs> are, we, are we okay? Do we, ha- do we have your voice back on that <laughs> microphone? You, you, you can take the next two minutes very okay, seriously. Yes, That'd be great. I will. I'll move on to my story. Um, so, last weekend, the NHL held its all-star weekend where the league season takes a five-day break at its halfway point and the league's ba- best players basically come together uh, on one big weekend for a three-on-three competition on the Sunday. But on the Saturday, they also hold a skills competition between all the players where they basically play games like Hardest Shot, Fastest Skater, things like that. But this year, history was made as American Kendall Coyne Schofield became the first female player to take part in the all-star skills competition. She competed in the fastest skater competition and she was damn good too. I think it was 14.2 seconds, something like that, that she clocked. Um, Later in the week, she also made her NHL broadcasting debut as an analyst for NBC. But there's always a but with things like this. Much of the talk instead centred on the criticism uh, of the comments and the behaviour of long-time NBC analyst Pierre Maguire. Many people accuse 57-year-old Maguire of mansplaining ice hockey to Coin Schofield, a woman who is an Olympic gold medalist and a five-time world champion with the US. So, what did Pierre say? With the two doing analysis for the Pittsburgh versus Tampa Bay game, Maguire first to- told Coin Schofield which team was sitting where on the bench, because that's not obvious. Um, and later on, he, al- he also said that she was being paid to be an analyst, not a fan. More peculiarly, as things got intense during the play, Coyne Schofield joked that she would need a mouth guard because of how intense it was between the two benches, so she was standing in between the two benches. Maguire then quipped that it was like the US-Canada gold medal game at Pyeongchang, uh, and Coyne Schofield then bantered back that she had a cage on during that game, as all female players do in the women's game around their faces. Pierre then replied, I'll be your cage. I'll leave, I'll leave you with that. That's timing. What a quote to end that so, on. Yeah, it's just, it was a very bizarre moment when he made that, <laughs> that quip. Uh, he also did the all-star skills <clears throat> competition that Coin Schofield was, took part in um, and said, no one wants to lose to you. Make of that quote what you will. I think that we're going to be seeing a few more of these examples until that generation of pundits and commentators are are removed or educated otherwise. Big pioneering moment for her, though, because <laughs> she's still only 26. There's still a lot of hockey in her, um, yeah. game-wise. But I mean, we look at what Alex Scott is doing in this country in terms of punditry for football, and there's a high chance that Coin Schofield is replicating what Alex Scott is doing um, in, in the ice hockey world. So. Alex Scott, of course, nominated for an... Sports Journalist Award um, Association Award this week, as were a number of other females, which was great to see. Exactly, yes. So I've seemed to have got three negative stories this week. Oh, nice. Unfortunately, the second one is is that it's a slightly worrying time for Formula One and the future of the sport. 
So this week, the Formula One Promoters Association, which represents 16 out of the 21 tracks, has basically said it's not happy with the way the sport is being run. And this is mainly about a loss of free-to-air coverage. So in the UK, we were the last country to have races, all race, or some races, aired where everyone could watch it. That's now gone. Italy were the previous ones, and, and they lost it at the start of last season. Um, and there's also a lack of clarity over the new rules and how they're going to be bought in. And also the way that F1 is attracting new races and going about bidding for new races. So five legendary tracks, GB, Italy, Spain, Germany, and Mexico, are all out of contract at the end of the season. All are really willing to carry on hosting the sport they already want to, but they don't like the terms being offered to them when the likes of Miami, Florida, and the proposed new races in America are being given advantageous deals to host these new races. Liberty Media have previously said they want to prioritise European races because that's where the history of the sport is and everything like that. But so far they've had made a lot of promises like that and haven't come good on it. Part of that is because of the situation Bernie Eccleston left them in. He basically left them, they left the sport in a mess and things like the Sky deal where they've now taken all the, the, the live races. Liberty couldn't do anything about. But then they've also not been very proactive. So... It's just worrying that you know five of these races could be going, and these are, these are cr- crucial races. Everyone loves these races, and if they go, then others are going to follow suit. So, F1 has been in crisis like this before, and bigger crises, but it is a worrying time um, about where the sport's going, and with the rise of Formula E as well. Who knows where the future leads? I had two seconds left. Ooh. We're pinpoint accuracy on the timing today. So my final story then is the retirement of one of the greats of winter sport. Three-time Olympic medalist Lindsay Vonn announced her retirement on Friday from skiing, saying that her body is broken beyond repair and it's screaming to stop. The 34-year-old was uh, closing in on a record number of World Cup wins, but she's been plagued with injuries recently and she also had surgery back in the spring. She said she'll compete in the World Championships next week in Sweden in the downhill and the Super G, and then that will be that. To put her career into perspective, she won downhill gold at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, Super G bronze at the same games, and also downhill bronze in Pyeongchang 2018 last year, making her the oldest woman uh, to claim a Winter Olympics Alpine skiing medal. She will also retire just four victories short of equaling uh, Ingemar Stenmark's record of 86 World Cup wins. Still, though, 82 World Cup wins is a pretty damn good uh, tally to rack up. And so, as we were talking about it before we started recording, great career, but if it hadn't been for her body letting her down on the injury front, she could have done so, so much more. Last thing, Lindsay Vonn has sort of struck me as being the first proper superstar of winter sports that we've known about in this country for, for various reasons, obviously not just on the track and on the slopes, but also for what she has a quite a celebrity figure about her as well for various reasons. But I only seem to ever remember her being injured. So unfortunately I don't, I've not been able to experience her at her absolute best, but yeah, what a career she's had and such a shame that injury has ravaged so much of it because of you think of how good she could have been, how many records she could have set, but still to, to have done what she's done with all the injuries she's had is is uh, is amazing and she's a very very classy competitor and she'll she'll be missed on the circuit exactly but i'm sure she still has a big big role to play in winter <laughs> sports uh, later down the line and let's hope that she can end on a high at these world championships as well exactly final story from me and it's one that went under the radar this week i didn't see it reported too much but it's about the world para swimming championships which are due to which were due to be held in malaysia in july of this year but the country has been stripped of hosting them, not because of funding or anything like that, but because of their political views towards Israel. Basically, the country says it would not allow Israeli athletes to compete because the current government and the prime minister basically are fans because the Israelis are Jewish and they're persecuting the majority Muslim Palestinians and the Malaysian government is majority Muslim. So politics once again coming into sports, playing a role. And even though the Malaysian Council had previously said in 2017 that anyone would be allowed to compete no matter who they were, as long as they were eligible, since this new Prime Minister was sworn in last May, that stance has now changed. 
and swimming associations have said that's enough. Fortunately, there seem to be another of other cities that are well equipped to host such an event. So it looks as though that come February the 11th, which is the deadline for the new entries, there will be a significant number to, to, a significant number to choose from and that the Paris Swimming World Championships will still be going ahead. But it's just frustrating that once again, politics is taking away from what should just, should just be the pleasure of sport. And having, having an event like the World Paris Swimming in Malaysia was going to be so good for that country, getting them on the sporting map. And they've blown their chance. The, the latest in a long line of politics having an interfering role in the world of sport. But then isn't it interesting that you see things like that that affects the organiser's decision. But then you look at all the events that have been held in places like Saudi Arabia, which have been allowed to go ahead. Qatar, they have Qatar. a current, there's a blockade on them. But we're still having a World Cup there in 2022. There's a very interesting piece in The Guardian, it was this week, about the, the Asian Cup that obviously Tottenham Son Heung Ming was on and the lack of spectators there and all the political undertones in that tournament. Um, yes, the 2022 Football Cup could be, if it still happens in that country, it could be a very interesting spectacle for non-footballing reasons. Yes. I can't, cannot remember when the final of the Asian Cup is, but I'm pretty sure it was between Qatar and Japan. Yeah, again, Qatar won 3-1. Japan weren't very good. Good Asian Cup knowledge. Anyway, with that, that concludes the News Roundup section. Uh, more to come after this. You're listening to Sportspiel, available on Audioboom, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're now a year on since Pyeongchang 2018 and female snow sport in Britain has arguably never been healthier. In the early hours of this morning, as we record, Izzy Atkin, who won Britain's first Olympic medal on skis 12 months ago, took a bronze in the big air at the World Championships in Park City, Utah. That came off the back of Charlotte Banks, who switched her allegiance from France to Britain earlier, uh, winning Britain's first ever World Championships snowboarding medal as she won silver in the snowboard cross. There's also the matter of Mena Fitzpatrick and Jen Ho winning their second para-alpine World Championship gold medal. Um, that was a few days ago in the, in the Super G. You can then add the names like Millie Knight, Charlie Guest, Katie Umrod, all sorts of people to the equation. So, just how much quality is there right now in, in our winter sports ranks? We'll let him, we'll let him finish his coughing. I think the, the amount of quality on show is, is brilliant and there's such an abundance of talent at the moment. Uh, obviously, you mentioned Mena Fitzpatrick and Jennifer Cahoe there. They became the first British skiers to hold Paralympic and world titles at the same time, which is fantastic. Um, also, Kelly Gallagher, she was the first ever British Paralympic champion back in 2014. She picked up some medals as well with her new guide. And he talks about it there, Millie Wilde not there because unfortunately her, her guide, Brett Wilde, who we had on the show, is, is injured. Then you've got the likes of Rowan Cheshire on, uh, on the skis and Katie Ormond on the snowboards. The Summer Hayes sisters as well, one of them I think is still competing. Izzy Atkin, and then you go over to the men's side, you've still got Billy Morgan. So much talent there at the moment. And then that's not even taking into account other Winter Olympic sports as well. There's clearly a, a focus being put on the winter games and the winter sports by our governing bodies. The funding is going there, apart from to short track speed skating. That's another debate in itself. Except for one person. <clears throat> Except for one person, but the fact is we're actually now becoming successful. And GB Snow Sport has said by 2030 they want our skiers and our snowboarders to be in the top five. One of the we want to be in the, one of the top five nations in the world. And if you look at the ages of all these people coming through, there's so many young, talented skiers and snowboarders that that is actually quite a realistic aim if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, that brings me perfectly onto my mini list if you like some of the ages we talked about um or some of the the athletes that we talked about so izzy atkin is still 20 which is ridiculous um charlotte banks is 23 millie knight who's been on this podcast is 20 katie ormrod 21 charlie guest is 25 men fitzpatrick is 20 as well um and like you said traditionally winter sports have not been 
our forte, if you like, in this country. It's not really been where the focus is. It's always been more of a Summer Olympics focus than anything Winter Games related. Um, so in terms of what's changed, I think we have to look at the funding side of things and just how much of a, an impact is now being put on the Winter Games. Pyeongchang was the biggest team Team GB had ever sent. And I mean, we, we're not so long ago from, from the days when we were just about getting one or two medals at a Winter Olympics. Set a target of five at the most recent games last year and got five. So that is clearly a sign that snow sport is really moving in the right direction. If you, t you talk about funding there, I think I saw uh, Nick Hope, the BBC's Olympic reporter, say this week that I think it was two years ago that men are uh, Fitzpatrick and Jennifer Coe were spotted effectively and people have said oh actually they look like they've got some talent we'll give them some funding and all of a sudden they're Paralympic champions world champions so that that funding really is for these guys crucial I think there's also you're getting we're getting a lot of women coming through but I think it's because there's no gender restraints I guess that's been placed on snow sport because it's such a new thing for this country that women are seeing it and, and men but women in particular are seeing it as oh you know, there's there's a field we can go and conquer. You know, th there's no one telling us we can't because we're women. Let's go and do it, and and the success is coming through. And also, then you've got talent programs that are transferring female athletes over two boards more towards sort of track sports like the skeleton and, and ice skating. But even then, taking across women into these new sports in new territories, and they can make their own history. And then women are seeing that and saying, I want to be part of this history as well. Let's go join it. So I think it's just going to be pardon the pun, but a snowball effect. Um, and also, we, we've got a couple of athletes in there who have been brought up on the slopes, which, and they're now competing for GB, so take advantage of that. Oh, yeah, and I mean, you mentioned the programmes, and of course, Laura Dees was one of the ones who came as, through that, as was that Lizzie programme, Arnold. as was Lizzie Arnold, and they've both done okay, haven't they? Yeah, pretty well. Just, just a bit. Um, I will ask this question. People kind of know my views on it anyway, but I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit, and should we look at the nationality side of things? Um, because Charlotte Banks, for example, who is now uh, our first World Championships um, medal-winning snowboarder, but not so long ago she was a French snowboarder, um, should be clarified for people who don't know that Charlotte Banks moved from Hemel Hempstead with a family when she was three years old. They moved to um, a place in the Southern Alps in France. Look at, no, no disrespect to Hemel Hempstead, but if you were given the choice of living in the Alps or Hemel Hempstead, which one are you going to pick? Um, but yeah, her family are British, pretty much. Um, and there's also Izzy Atkin, who is US born, and when she won her Pyeongchang Winter Olympics medal, a lot of people only heard her accent and went, oh my God, she's American. Forgetting the fact that her dad is British and that her mum is Malaysian. So, I think there are, there are two different arguments here. A lot of people, when they have a go at the plastic Brits, they're talking about the ones who weren't born in this country, maybe even have one British parent or something like that, and then have come over here. Charlotte Banks is slightly different because she was born in this country, two British parents then went away. So I think people will generally have less of an issue with her representing Great Britain than they will Izzy Atkin, who hasn't really lived over here. But ultimately, if... if I, my viewpoint has changed over the years. I used to be, oh no, you've got to be born right. But actually, if you think about it, if you think about it, nationality is what you perceive it to be. So if, for example, you were born in America, but to a British father and you wanted to see yourself as British, then I don't see the issue with that anymore. The fact is she's had dual citizenship all her life. And for most of her career, she's competed under the GB flag, I think I'm correct in saying. So I don't see any problem with it. Personally, likewise, um, I'll throw my opinion out there as well. I always think nationality is a very individual thing. I don't think it's for anyone else to dictate someone else's nationality. It's very individual. Um, I always look at my dad, who's kind of a very good example of this. If you go on where he was born, he's Tanzanian. If you go on where my dad grew up, he's Canadian. If you go on where my dad lives and has lived for the last 20 odd years, he's British. It's a very individual thing. Competition-wise, I've always been of the impression that once you have competed for a nation on the competitive stage, you should stick to that. It's kind of somewhere where I think football has actually got it relatively right because once you obviously made a competitive appearance for a country, you can't then switch back. Um, but yes, it, nationality is a very individual thing and I think it's up for that individual person to decide, not for anyone else to dictate. So on that competitive appearance thing then, do you think 
Charlotte Banks, having represented France at two Olympics, should have been able to, to switch over to GB. That's the thing. That's, that's where I'm like, oh, you've already competed for France. You should probably stick with France. But I know she has her own individual reasons for that because I know there was that article that came from Nick Hope um, earlier this week where she basically has left the France Federation because of her injury problems and that she was frustrated that they weren't able to, to find a permanent cure, if you like, to the, to the injury problems that she was having and that the British rehab program that she's been put on has actually done wonders for her um, and she said that it was either switch nationality or quit altogether so then you have to kind of take in the uh, extra circumstances that she's going through too. Also if you think about it she competed at 2014 games would Britain have been in, in a position to have even been able to fund her or, or take her on at that time yes they can now because of the, the change of focus and the levels of success but at the time I don't know, it's very unclear as to whether Britain would have actually been able to fund her anyway, so again, I don't have much of a problem with it. And she's one of the world's best, so I think we should all welcome her with open arms. Hello medals. Hello medals. So, last point then, um, with the growth in winter sports, if you like, are we seeing as well a growth in the public interest and people wanting or wanting to tune in and wanting to see some of the action? And I look at our own Winter Olympic specials, um, if you want to look at it on a micro scale and the success of our Winter Olympic specials shows that the interest is definitely there. Yeah, they're getting an increased following all the time. People are looking now in an age where the media is saturated with football. People are getting fed up with it and looking for alternate sports to follow. And these are really exciting, interesting sports. They're not that difficult to understand, most of them. Um, and you've got some really cool athletes who are successful. What What isn't there to like, really? I think that's one of the big things, actually. Cool sport, yes. But actually, the people doing them are really interesting characters. James Woods, for example. Really engaging personality and someone you can quickly, you know, cotton on to and, and really enjoy watching. Um, so, yeah, I think that's part of it, is people are buying into the, the athletes and their own personalities as well as the... A unique sport aspect. Another one is Elise Christie. We've had her on the show and she's not your stereotypical athlete by any stretch of the imagination. She's not afraid to say what she thinks. And We've got an hour's worth of podcast and, and episodes. She, she's different. That. She's quirky and whether you love her or you hate her, she is, like, for, she's a, herself. for a journalist and from a, from a uh, public point of view, she is herself. She's different and she's attractive in terms of that you want to follow her and see how she does. So we need to just make sure that these guys stay natural and, and they're not brainwashed into being boring, basically, like other sports. Exactly. As I've often said to people, at least Christy, one of my favourite athletes ever to interview, trust me, for anyone in the journalism business, business, it's not easy to interview someone for more than, say, 20, 25 minutes. And we had a chat for about an hour and it was so damn easy. Um, so, yeah. It was easy to listen to as well. I remember listening to it and I'm thinking... I'd been listening for 45 minutes. I was like, where on earth has the time gone? It was just, it's a brilliant listen. If you haven't tuned in, make sure you do. Yes, and on that final plug for more of our episodes, we will conclude the discussion section. Um, more is to come after this very short break. Now, listeners, we come on to the part of the show where I potentially embarrass myself in front of everyone. It's Ask Alistair. So... Will, do, do explain for people. So it's a new feature that we brought in. I ask Alistair a sporting question, and he basically has to try and get it right. If he gets it right, he gets a point. If he gets it wrong, he loses a point. There's also a question for the audience as well. So Alistair, you are on one point, if I remember correctly. Yes, after my success last time. You summer. identified Felipe Massa as being the driver hit on the head during the Hungarian Grand Prix qualifying in 2009. Also, two members of the audience are on plus one point as well, in Ryan Anderton and Ian Murfin, for both correctly identifying 1903 as the year the first Tour de France was held. This time round, Alistair, you get a choice of question or choice of topics. So would you like an Olympic question or would you like a football question? Let's say, let's say a football question, please. Okay. Who was the first African side to compete at a football men World Cup, and that's a men's football World Cup, when they appeared in the 1934 tournament? African, right? African. A long pause. I don't 
going to say something stupid. He's having a lengthy think about this. 1934. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Let's pick one out of the hat. There haven't been many African sides at Football World Cups. I know, but I reckon this is going to be a niche one. It's not that niche. Cameroon. Oof. No. Egypt. Aww. The first African side to appear at a Men's Football World Cup back in 1934. Safe to say they didn't actually get very far. I, so I you, are, I can't remember you are back on to zero points, I'm afraid. And now a question for the audience. Would you, it'd be interesting to see if you got this. The first modern Olympics were held in Greece. It's in which year? So that's one for you guys to think about over the next couple of weeks. If you did A-level PE, you will know this. I did not do A-level PE. Is that one of the subjects? Yeah. One, it was one of the topics. It was one of the one I did it anyway. It's more of a history lesson though, isn't it? Well, that's the question. And I'm sure there will be someone out there who can get it right. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, I don't know the answer as per. Um, so yeah, tweet it. Facebook it to us, email it, whichever. Don't Google. Please and don't cheat. Yes, as we said, that's not the game. If you Google it, please play along. Um, and yeah, send us send us your answers and we'll give a shout out on the next episode to whoever, whoever gets it right first. Anyway, uh, that is it for this embarrassing section. Um, messages uh, to come after this. <laughs> Okie dokies then, listener. That is nearly it for this latest episode of the podcast. So episode 35 is drawing to a close. Some final messages for everyone before we pop off. As ever, please follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. All of our handles are Sportspiel Pod, so you can search for us there. Um, we're also on LinkedIn. I never remember to mention that one, but if you're into LinkedIn, we're on that as well. Um, you can also send us any feedback or any messages uh, that you'd like to our email address, which is sportsbillpod at gmail.com. The two of us are going to be back for a full-length episode on the 17th of February, which is two weeks today. But we, we're slightly vague on this. There may or may not be some special episodes before that or even after that. There That's are the thing we've <laughs> got. Uh, we've got a backlog. We have plenty of interviews that we could use. It's just... Trying to find out them. when to use them and getting photos. Yes, and as I'm sure you've mentioned before, the Six Nations are currently ongoing and there may be some more Six Nations specials to come. Yep, that's hopefully we'll have two more on. Six Nations specials to come. Yes. Um, final plug then for anyone who hasn't listened to our Six Nations special that went out on Thursday. Um, please do listen to that. We've got five members of the England team that will, so neatly conducted interviews with not often you get five athletes on one episode so do tune in um i always like it when you've got more than one person as they kind of they bounce off of one another in if you and you definitely they certainly get doing that. the fun questions at the end so and that's one I, worth yes. one worth listening to i noticed while editing that um also much love to k2 um and the 52 blog which is essentially you um but still yeah. uh we're, we're collaborating. Teamwork makes the dream work, as I tweeted. Um, so, yeah, we always look forward to doing more stuff as a trio in the future because um, I know we have a lot of the same values and we like to plug the same sort of stuff. So good to be in partnership with everyone. And with that, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to catch that Six Nations special and do tune in to some sport in the next while. Until next time, it's goodbye from the two of us and we will see you very soon.